consequences of these behaviors for health outcomes. Her work has been published in Demography, Gender and Society, and Journal of Health and Social Behavior, among other outlets. Her research has been supported by funding from the ASA Minority Fellowship Project, the American Association of University Women, and the Society of Family Planning. She is the author of Just Get on the Pill, The Uneven Burden of Reproductive Politics from the University of California Press 2021 where she uses in-depth interviews with young women to examine how taken for granted ideas about gender structure inequality in pregnancy uh, prevention. Dr. Lina Maria Murillo is an assistant professor in gender, women's and sexuality studies and history at the University of Iowa. She received her doctorate in borderlands history at the University of Texas, El Paso in 2016. Her research interests include borderlands, women's health and reproductive justice, Latina, Latino, Latinx studies, and social justice movements. She is completing her first history ma manuscript titled Fighting for Control, Reproductive Care, Race, and Power in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands. And joining us virtually, Shelly Tremaine, Tremaine holds a PhD in philosophy from York University in Canada. She has taught in Canada, the US and Australia and publishes on a range of topics, including philosophy of disability, Michel Foucault, feminist philosophy, ableism in philosophy, social metaphysics and epistemology and biopolitics, bioethics. From April, 2015, Tremaine has coordinated, edited and produced dialogues in disability the groundbreaking and critically acclaimed series of interviews that she is conducting with disabled philosophers and posts to biopolitical philosophy on the third Wednesday of each month. Tremaine is the author of Foucault and Feminist Philosophy of Disability from University of Michi Mi Michigan Press from 2017, the manuscript for which was awarded the 2016 Tobin Siebers Prize for Disability Studies in the Humanities. She's also the editor of two editions of Foucault and the Government of Disability from the University of Michigan Press 2005 and 2015, the first of which has been translated into Korean. The editor of the Bloomsbury Guide to Philosophy of Disability, which is forthcoming. Shelley Tremaine was also the 2016 recipient of the Tennis Doe Award for Disability Studies and Culture in Canada, the Ed Roberts postdoctoral fellow at the University of California at Berkeley and the World Institute on Disability in Oakland, California, and a principal investigator for Canada's National Policy Research Institute to promote the human rights of disabled people. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. We will begin with Dr. Little John. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Hi, everybody. Uh, the title of my talk is Stratified Reproductive Justice, a Framework for Grappling with Diverse Reproductive Incursion. I want to start with an admittedly provocative assertion. I'm not sure that reproductive justice is for everyone. And to be clear, that doesn't mean that a reproductively just future isn't. I think, though, that in order to move forward with the promise of reproductive justice, given everything that we know about the past, we all must think critically about what reproductive justice is, what it isn't, and what it must be to maintain its integrity as a radical framework and movement started by women of color to address the reproductive oppression that they face. This is especially important in this post row moment. One of the challenges that I see for the future is making sure to avoid decentering the needs of the women and people that reproductive justice was created to protect. I think that in this moment, we need a framework that takes up what reproductive justice has to offer without sacrificing its commitment to a radically reproductive just, re radically reproductively just future for women of color, marginalized women, and all people capable of pregnancy, regardless of their gender identity. In this talk, I offer stratified reproductive justice as a flexible framework that offers one way to move forward for people interested in reproductive just in, interested in applying reproductive justice 
to other contexts that are not squarely centered on Black and marginalized people who give birth or are capable of pregnancy. For those who don't know, reproductive justice is a framework and movement that was created by women of color activists who believe that the mainstream reproductive rights movement failed to adequately address the needs of Black and marginalized women. A group of Black women activists coined the term reproductive justice in 1994, and the sister song Women of Color Reproductive Health Collective, Collective. a group of 16 women of color organizations, promoted the use of the term using a human rights framework. The central tenets of reproductive justice are that every person who can become pregnant has the right to have a child, not have a child, and parent the children they have in safe and healthy communities. It has been an incredibly powerful vehicle for articulating and advocating for the rights of women of color and marginalized women for several decades. As many, if not all of us have noticed, it's been central to discussions of the reproductive violations taking place in the wake of Dobbs. While I firmly believe that everyone should know about reproductive justice and the importance of its centrality in guiding all of our thinking and action about reproductive health and rights, I also think that we must think critically and, st and strategically about how we take it up and deploy it. As a Black feminist and scholar of reproductive justice, I believe that it is within an intersectional context with an eye on histories of subjugation that we need to think about the future. I believe that in deploying reproductive justice in new contexts, we need to grapple with anti-Black racism, structural gender racism, and their interrelationship with reproductive oppression. It is in this spirit that I offer stratified reproductive justice. Stratified reproductive justice is a framework that extends reproductive justice by integrating stratified reproduction, which is a concept that recognizes that some women's fertility is valued and policed more than other women's and other people's. And it was a term coined by Shelley Colin in 1986. From a stratified reproductive justice or SRJ perspective, struggles to articulate reproductive justice for a broader group of people and issues must occur first by situating their experiences and histories within the respective context of oppression and privilege to appropriately address their needs without encroaching on the often fragile rights of targeted groups. Uncritically applying reproductive, reproductive justice not, not only can lead to undermining one of the most important frameworks of the last several decades, but it can also lead to harming the very people that the framework was created to protect. So to be clear, stratified reproductive justice is not meant to offer a specific definition, but instead to provide a way of thinking that helps develop visions of reproductive justice that remain grounded in a rejection of oppression and the multitudinous ways that it affects different communities, rather than an obfuscation of power and inequity in service of achieving quote unquote reproductive justice for all. So with all of this established, I want to offer some ways to think about reproductive justice in the context of sperm, which is a project I'm currently working on. And it's been particularly important in this post Dobbs moment when there has been increasing attention on the role of partners in helping to prevent pregnancy. And for those who don't know or who came in a little late, my work focuses primarily on contraception and abortion. So number one, the human right to have a child. So this tenet, I think, is perhaps the most obviously susceptible to the furtherance of harm without a stratified reproductive justice lens. If just lifting reproductive justice as a framework without attention to its commitment to eradicating oppression, this tenet could be used to advocate for the rights of someone other than the pregnant person, which could of course lead to reproductive coercion. And we know that this violates a core tenet of reproductive justice and is all too familiar as a form of reproductive oppression. And thinking about the human right to have a child using a stratified reproductive justice lens, it becomes clear that reproductive justice in the context of sperm requires grappling with how articulating rights in this domain affects existing power structures that are used to regulate and surveil bodies of those capable of pregnancy. To argue that people who contribute their sperm have the human right to have a child could contribute to the continued entrenchment of horrific violations that have occurred before Dobbs and that continue to occur even more frequently in its wake. Instead, stat stratified reproductive justice suggests the importance of articulating a different set of principles that draw on the reproductive vision of human rights, but apply well in the context of sperm. From a stratified reproductive justice perspective, for example, low-income people who produce sperm have the human right to have their fertility understood. They have the human right to have the etiology of their infertility researched and taken seriously. They have the right to access support for infertility treatments without stigma. 
If they identify as trans and decide to have a biological child, they have the right to pursue that option without fear of violence or retribution. Thus, as illustrated, reproductive justice offers a vision for people's rights and stratified reproductive justice offers a framework for thinking about how to envision these basic rights in other contexts. Drawing on a core tenet of reproductive justice in this way uplifts its radical potential for advancing justice for people denied rights in and out of court without siphoning power from others that are disenfranchised. It can center the experience of marginalized people while also applying to people who have more privilege, just as reproductive justice has always done. The human right not to have a child. Next, we have the human right not to have a child, which is where I've spent most of my career focus. Once again, stratified reproductive justice calls our attention to the grave importance of rejecting a simplistic application of reproductive justice. And here, I just wanna take a moment to mention that as I'm providing examples, I'm always thinking about this in intersectional context and the ways that people's uh, existence at multiple intersections of oppression can influence their experiences. So I just wanna make that clear if it ever seems like I'm not. So once again, stratified reproductive justice calls our attention to the grave importance of rejecting the simplistic application of reproductive justice. People who can produce sperm do not have the right to apply coercive tactics or otherwise compel partners to act in particular ways to fulfill their own desire to avoid pregnancy and births. Instead, upholding reproductive justice in the context of sperm in this case means that people have a right to pursue knowledge, access tools, and receive resources to prevent pregnancy. They have a right to access vasectomy affordably and without stigma. They have a right to use and have access to prescription methods designed to target sperm so that they too may feel secure in preventing pregnancy at each act of sexual intercourse. They have a right to have access to these methods when and where they need them. They have a right to learn about fertility and all birth control methods rather than, than those only considered as appropriate for their bodies so that they can approach sexual intercourse with the knowledge that they need to achieve their reproductive goals. And though it is often de-emphasized as a contraceptive tool in relation to prescription contraception, they have the human right to, to wear condoms for the prevention of pregnancy and disease. Of course, this is all just a short list of issues but my hope is that stratified reproductive justice serves as a generative framework to apply to a whole host of issues under this and other core tenets of reproductive justice. And lastly, we have the human right to parent children they have in safe and healthy environments. Stratified reproductive justice suggests that thinking through parenting requires grappling with the complex matrices of oppression that entangle caregivers, whether they contribute their sperm or eggs. It means fighting against a carceral system that would see black and brown children removed from their caregivers. It means putting an end to gun violence that robs people of their children. It means eradicating police violence that disproportionately robs black and brown children of their parents. It means fighting against laws that would see children removed from, from the homes of parents who support their gender affirming care. Rather than offering a myopic and simplistic vision of reproductive justice as reproductive justice for all, Stratified reproductive justice calls on us to consider these and other dimensions of privilege and oppression for the targeted group to center a vision that addresses the most marginalized to pull them in from the margins while also being applicable for people traditionally at the center. In sum, it is my hope that, it, that in advancing stratified reproductive justice as a framework for those looking to apply it to their communities of interest, I can uplift the voices of reproductive justice leaders while maintaining the integrity of a radical activist framework created to address the systemic oppression that women of color and people capable of pregnancy suffer. Stratified reproductive justice rests on the premise that true reproductive justice requires recognizing the differences in needs and the disproportionate violation of rights faced by targeted and non-targeted groups when advocating for better conditions using a reproductive justice frame. I offer stratified reproductive justice as an emergent concept that I hope will generate conversation and new ideas to move forward with our cr critical, transformative, and liberatory work. And with that said, I just also want to mention, I'm really looking forward to our Q&A, hearing from the other panelists, so we can continue to engage in a really generative conversation. Thank you, everybody. Much and uh, now, Professor Murillo will speak. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to my fellow co-panelists. I'm very excited for this conversation. And I want to thank Rionin and Kamisha Russell 
and the entire Hypatia team for their generous invitation to share my work at this conference. Um, my paper is titled The Politics of U.S.-Mexico Border Rule and Reproductive Injustice. And so I hope that you all allow me to begin with um, the statement by Bahrainian Canadian scholar activist Harsha Walia from her 2021 book titled Border and Rule. Quote, U.S.-Mexico border rule intersects with global and domestic forms of warfare positioned as a linchpin in the concurrent process of expansion, elimination, enslavement, thus solidifying white settler power or racial exclusion and migrant expulsion. Much of my scholarship centers the history of women's reproduction along the US-Mexico border. For me, this region merits special attention because it remains one of the most politicized and racialized borders in the world. Its history and politics expand our understanding of reproductive justice when examining this critical context zone. A scholar activist Harsha Walia states in the quote, the US-Mexico border serves as a linchpin in the control and maintenance of white settler power in the Western hemisphere, which she calls US-Mexico border rule. A focus on reproduction within this matrix elucidates how and why migrants have confronted white settler border regimes in search of reproductive justice and freedom and brings to the fore the various systems that have stifled their protracted struggle. While there's a growing body of literature about abortion travel, especially given recent and drastic changes in abortion laws in the US, other border crossings are not similarly examined through the lens of reproductive liberation. Abortion becomes the de facto reason for why people travel for reproductive health care, while other concerns are seen as marginal, but not central to the fight for reproductive justice. It is time to understand the relational past and present of these histories to gain a better appreciation for the violent implications of borders and the precarity of those who cross them for care. And so in my brief talk today, I hope to begin what will become in subsequent articles and essays and conversations, a nuanced understanding um, and discussion about global about borders, borders, beginning with the US-Mexico US border and those who are forced to traverse national borders in search of reproductive liberation. And you're probably gonna hear us define reproductive justice like two other times, so I'll go ahead and do it. Um, I'm gonna define um, reproductive justice and freedom RJ is an ever-expanding analytical and praxis-based framework centered on the human rights of people to have children, not have children, and parent the children they have in safe and sustainable environments. The fight for freedom is based on a call for the human right to bodily autonomy, sovereignty, dignity, and care. Using this definition allows us to understand the movement of women and families across the U.S.-Mexico divide as intimately tied to reproductive injustices beginning uh, in the 19th century when the border was established. Historians of the U.S. birth control movement have written extensively about the waves of concerns for women's se sexual morality arising in the mid-19th century. The 1873 Comstock laws prohibiting the exchange of so-called lewd materials, including information about contraception and abortion via the US Postal Service, serves as a primary example of national moralistic fears. Historians of the borderlands acknowledge these anxieties extended beyond the regulation of US women's based um, access to birth control information and encompass the ability of women's movement, notably in the Page Act, of 1875. The Page Act denied entry to Chinese migrant women labeled, quote, potential sex workers and spreaders of sexually transmitted infections. The racialist logic that inspired the Page Act was later applied to the Immigration Act of 1903, seeking, quote, again, to exclude all women and girls entering the United States for, quote, lewd and immoral purposes and or prostitution. Uh, my dear colleague and friend, historian Celeste Menchaca, writes about this and explains that the Bureau of Immigration's concerns with controlling the sexual immorality of non-white migrant women undergirded the need to procure detention facilities for them along the border that far exceeded what non-white migrant men experienced at the time. For instance, as Mexican origin women made their way to the U.S. for work in agriculture factories or as domestics in the homes of white settlers, 
they encountered immigration officials willing to use a variety of policies to keep them out, including, quote, any other immoral purpose or, quote, likely to become a public charge. Menchaca concludes that, quote, Mexican female border crossers who were single, pregnant, prostitutes, women in sexual relationships outside of marriage, and or women involved in an interracial union became caught in a web of surveillance and were denied entry, faced attention, and were deported while their Mexican able-bodied male counterparts encountered a relatively fluid line, close quote. Mexican origin women experienced a kind of hypersexuality at border crossings vis-a-vis -vis the denial of entry if they did not conform or were perceived not to conform to white settler sexual norms. The US immigration regime refused them any kind of reproductive autonomy as supposedly sexually deviant detainees. Historian Grace Peña Delgado maintains that anxieties about Mexicans' supposed sexual lasciviousness and fears about white slavery, and in this case, they, they defined it as middle-class women supposedly stolen for life of prostitution in the borderlands, produce, quote, the origins of the U.S. federal immigration control through its sexual policing of the U.S.-Mexico border. Surveillance and control of women's sexuality set the foundation for U.S.-Mexico border rule. And in fact, these detention centers that were um, established along the border precede the establishment of the Border Patrol in 1924. Keeping supposedly sexually deviant non-white migrant women out was equally as important as ridding the country of Mexican origin families during the Great Depression, less than five years later. Historian Laura Gutierrez describes the terror and misery experienced by my Mexican origin people during the era of forced deportations known as repatriation in the late 1920s and throughout the 1930s. Hundreds of thousands of Mexican origin people, many US citizens, were removed by local government officials in cities across the United States, but especially along the border. Worse back to Mexico, many with little to no money some with no family or kin to return to, Mexican origin families experienced what Gutierrez calls generational trauma as children and grandchildren recounted what their parents and grandparents experienced during this period of forced removal. Gutierrez explores the story of two daughters, Carmela Ruiz Villegas, Mercedes Ruiz Gutierrez, and what they told her about her, their mother's repatriation at the tender age of five. Born in Arizona, their mother, Andrea Hinojosa Garcia, remembered how their family was, quote, thrust into abject poverty as Andrea's mother and stepfather were forced to work in cotton fields and at, lo at a local market in the years after their forced repatriation. Andrea would tell her children of the, quote, backbreaking work her mother endured in Mexico's cotton fields. At the age of 14, Andrea married and never returned to the town where her parents were required to settle. Even after she returned to the United States with her own children, Andrea, a U.S. citizen, US citizen never, trusted never trusted the government, the government especially, especially as they received conflicting information from immigration officials about her family's legal status. Andrea's daughter later recalled how their mother would lament the stories of deported children, stating, quote, pobrecitos niños, como van a sufrir? Poor little children, how they were suffer. Viewed through the lens of reproductive injustice, Carmela Ruiz Villegas and Mercedes Ruiz Gutierrez recounted attempts by several generations of women in their families to provide safe and sustainable environments for their children to live and thrive as their grandmother and mother fought for care. Forced removal and the denial of rights as both as Mexican and US citizens reverberated through their family's lineage, marking how they understood their roles as women encountering the brutality of U.S.-Mexico border rule. In this context, one where U.S.-Mexico border rule determines non-white women's sexual morality and parents' ability to care for their children, it is important to consider the migrants' plight in crossing this divide for access to reproductive health care. As noted by historians Leslie Reagan, Alicia Gutierrez-Romain, and myself, women from the United States crossed the border into Mexico for abortion access en masse beginning in the 1940s. Abortion was illegal in the U.S. and Mexico at the time, and yet a small but noticeable community of abortion providers began to spread across Mexico's northern borderlands. 
By the 1960s, feminist activists in San Francisco had tapped into this critical reproductive health service, creating a vetted list of providers in the Mexico borderlands. Of course, US-based women feared passage into Mexico, a land marked as, quote, racially suspect, and into the hands of supposed Mexican providers who were racialized as inherently dangerous. To combat this fear, the Society for Humane Abortions, or SHAW, the feminist organization providing the compiled list of well-respected providers in Mexico offered women travelers instructions as they prepared their journey south. Shaw provided a document titled, quote, Preliminary Information for Women Seeking Abortions in Mexico. This resource guided women through the entire process, asking and advising on concerns such as, how pregnant are you? And choosing the right specialist given the client's location and financial means. Women also received information on what to do before they cross the border. Given the perilousness of abortion provision in the borderlands, abortion practitioners would be at one location one day and gone the next. Shaw advised women to purchase a map of Mexico's border states. Women were told to literally map out their alternate abortion routes. They should find different providers if practitioners became unavailable and adapt new routes via land and air if certain locations became off limits. Shaw activists explain that women seeking abortions should be mindful of providers, providers taking legitimate, legitimate vacations, vacations, but other times a turn go on vacation was code for laying low if police were on the prowl. The document instructed women to, quote, please keep your wits about you, consult your notes, your list of specialists, all in big letters, and your map and call other specialists in the same city or in the nearest city. One key section of the document described the border crossing itself, one that was revised after some women complained to Shaw upon the return to the US. In earlier drafts of the document, Shaw emphasized that, quote, most people encounter no difficulties whatsoever in crossing borders. The Shaw activists assured women that no immigration documents were needed to cross into Mexico uh, and its border towns if one was a native born adult US citizen. However, the following year, Shaw wrote an addendum to its border crossing directive. According to Shaw records, US Customs and Immigration agents at the El Paso border were subjecting US citizens to strip searches, presumably examining border travelers for dangerous drugs and other contraband. Quote, without witnesses present, the document explained, agents, quote, order the person to take off all their clothes. If the naive tourist refuses to comply, then he, she is stripped against their will and pawed intrusively in the pubic region by police agents, close quote. From reports obtained by Shaw, the most often subjected to these interventions were young people, men and women, who had long hair or dress, quote, like hippies. Shaw began providing detailed parameters so that people seeking abortions in Northern Mexico pose no major threats to themselves or to the referral service. Quote, we ask that women do as requested for the sake of all women, read the final note offered by Shaw activists as people contemplated a trip to Mexico for an abortion. Even as the Shaw team denounced the treatment of abortion seekers by U.S. border agents, they also pleaded for a strict adherence to their guidelines to protect the anonymity of doctors, the referral service, and women needing abortions in the future. Critical to the power of U.S.-Mexico border rule is the ever-changing dynamic of border crossing. Who is surveilled? For what reasons? How? When? And why this process unfolds? U.S. citizens presumed white could initially cross without problems. Quickly, this changed. Immigration officials viewed young Americans as deviant, suspected of trapping in their groins illegal Mexican substances to traffic across the border. On the other hand, Mexican origin women were rarely, if ever, afforded the ability to cross without inspection, and often not only denied entry into the US, but often detained. Those who suffered most, as Andrea Ignojosa Garcia surmised, were children and those lowest on the racial and gender white settler hierarchy. US Mexico border rule in today's context and its ramifications on people's reproductive lives reaches far beyond the geographical confines of the national borderline. Between Trump's family separation edict and Title 42, known as the Remain in Mexico policy, families have been systematically torn apart, some left at the border and others shipped hundreds of miles away. Images of countless children detained without their parents for weeks and left to cry in chain-linked cages their sobs preserved in audio recordings 
permanently affixing their despair for the sake of posterity should tear at our collective consciousness. Reports of migrant women in Georgia immigration detention centers being forcibly sterilized reverberates with the ghosts of past reproductive violences. Mexican origin women and other migrant women traveling from Mexico to obtain abortion access in cities like El Paso when Roe v. Wade was still law has shifted as US women once again cross the national boundary for access to abortion in Mexico today. Considering these current moments of reproductive injustices within the broader history of US-Mexico border rule reveals that these present instances are not aberrations. Rather, they are part of reinforcing and remaking that linchpin in quote, solidifying white settler power and racial exclusion and migrant expulsion to deny non-white migrants and others in need of reproductive freedom their due justice. Thank you. Much. Um, we will now turn to Dr. Tremaine's talk. Hello, hello. I'd like to begin by giving a brief description of what appears on the screen. I'm a white woman with short hair. I'm wearing large plastic glasses and long earrings. Behind me to my right, there's a clock on the wall and a window with curtains. Behind me on the, uh, to my left, there's a ceiling fan. I've joined this conference from the ancestral territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. The territory was the subject of the dish with one spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and Allied Nations around the Great Lakes. I'm very grateful to Kamisha Russell, Bonnie Mann, and the other conference organizers for inviting me to participate in this plenary. My presentation is entitled Reproducing Eugenic Injustice and zeroes in on some ways in which ableist injustice is reproduced and philosophy's role in reproducing this injustice. An expanded version of the argument will appear uh, as disaster ableism, epistemologies of crisis, and the mystique of bioethics, my chapter in the Bloomsbury Guide to Philosophy of Disability. If you wish to read along with me, I've now posted the text of the presentation to the Biopolitical Philosophy blog. You'll find the presentation at the top of the blog. So reproducing eugenic injustice, section one, misconceiving disability and mystifying bioethics. Philosophers increasingly engage in pointed discussions about academic freedom and philosophy and academia more widely, as well as participate in heated debates with members of the broader the public broad about freedom of speech in society at, at large. The most impassioned discussions and debates concern the philosophical legitimacy of so-called gender critical feminism, the publication of articles about supposedly innate differences between allegedly natural races and the extension to Peter Singer and Kathleen Stock of invitations to present their work in light of the former philosopher's remarks about the permissibility of infanticide in the case of disabled infants and the latter philosopher's renown as the leading advocate of so-called gender critical feminism and its claims about the immutability of binary sex. Notice the disparate levels of generality at which these uh, discourses take place, although Singer's arguments about disability are repeatedly condemned in the philosophical community. The systemic and structural character of the ableism that precipitated the arguments has gone virtually unaddressed and flourishes unabated. In other words, the singularity conferred upon Singer's arguments, which in turn frames common objections to them, enables both the eugenic impetus of the field of bioethics and the perilous statements of other bioethicists to remain systematically unchallenged, to be neutralized, and to persist. 
My argument is that the repeated identification of certain bioethicists, such as Singer, as the purveyors of eugenics within bioethics, should be recognized as a surreptitious technology that enables the undisrupted reproduction of eugenic ableism as a fundamental condition of possibility for the field of bioethics, including feminist bioethics and disability bioethics. Misconceptions of bioethics, according to which bioethics is an innocuous, if not progressive, field, field of inquiry, are vital to the mystique of bioethics. I use the term mystique of bioethics to refer to, first, the technology by which the eugenic impulse of bioethics is concealed, second, the structural gaslighting that enables this concealment, whereby the field of bioethics is cast as the domain of a distinct specialist knowledge that renders bioethicists uniquely qualified to evaluate a purportedly distinctive set of questions and concerns, and third, the technology of this supposedly specialist knowledge whereby through practices and strategies of mystification, which are constitutive of the apparatus of disability. Systemic social and political problems are constituted as natural, individual, and medical in origin. In this presentation, I draw upon Kyle White's work on epistemologies of crisis and Naomi Klein's writing about disaster capitalism to further elaborate my thesis that bioethics is the neoliberal neocolonial technology of government. White uses the term epistemologies of crisis to refer to colonialist narratives and ways of knowing that characterize certain situations and states of affairs as unprecedented and urgent, ignoring histories of colonization to do so. Klein uses the term disaster capitalism to de describe elements of neoliberalism that variously produce, exploit, and aggravate economic, political, environmental, and social disasters and crises, in ways that expand the reach of unregulated economic markets. My objective is to combine both White's insights and Klein's remarks with Michel Foucault's approach to argue that bioethics is an instrument and mechanism of biopower's neoliberal eugenics and ultimately an insidious enterprise of colonial power. The conception of disability that predominates in philosophy construes disability as a philosophically uninteresting objective and value neutral biological trait or property that some people embody or possess. Insofar as philosophers hold this naturalized and individualized conception of disability, they assume that disability is a prediscursive entity with transhistorical and transcultural properties that medicine and science can both astutely recognize and accurately represent, and to which universal philosophical principles can be applied. Yet a different understanding of disability is available, according to which the ontology of disability, the ontological status of disability, and the application of philosophical principles and theoretical frameworks to the phenomena of disability are performative and co-constitutive. As I argued in Reproductive Freedom, Self-Regulation, and the Government of Impairment in Utero, which appeared in Hypatia in 2006, the ontology of disability is always already a contingent political and hence value-laden state of affairs, an apparatus that should be historicized and relativized. In Foucault and, and philo feminist philosophy of disability, I assert that bioethics emerged as a technology of government to resolve the problem that the production of dis disability poses for the neoliberal management of societies. Indeed, the sub-discipline of bioethics, including feminist bioethics and so-called disability bioethics, is an institutionalized vehicle for the biopolitics of our time. That is, the intellectual resources that bioethics provides facilitate the strengthening of certain populations and the elimination of others. In short, the field of bioethics is a premier arena for the adjudication of biopower's governmental capacity to make live and let die, as Foucault put it. In other words, bioethics is a modern form of race science. That is, bioethics is founded on the rationalization of eugenic, pardon me, is founded on the rationalization of eugenics. For example, the subfield of bioethics rationalizes the proliferation and use of biotechnologies such as prenatal testing and genetic selection. And in doing so, bioethics simultaneously contributes to the constitution and elimination of impairment through the identification, evaluation, classification, and categorization of it. 
thereby enlarging the purview of the apparatus of disability and extending its reach. Hence, my argument is that in order for philosophy to advance justice for disabled people, bioethics as a mechanism and technology of the apparatus of disability must be abolished. As I've noted elsewhere, however, most philosophers nevertheless regard bioethics as the most suitable domain in philosophy for considerations about disability as the persistent lack of job opportunities in philosophy of disability and the concurrent proliferation of jobs of bioethics and cognate fields indicate. In so-called Canada, for example, bioethicists have played a crucial role in the creation of a culture of eugenics within the discipline of philosophy and in the Canadian milieu at large, both influencing the development and promulgation of legislation in Canada to expand state sanction assisted suicide and euthanasia that is made and ensuring that disabled specialists in philosophy of disability do not enter the ranks of professional philosophy in Canada. Canada now has the most permissive euthanasia assisted suicide legislation in the world thanks in no small part to Canadian bioethicists and other philosophers. Insofar as bioethics, is an instrument and mechanism of neoliberalism which aims to normalize populations in ways, in ways that make them cost-effective and governable. An understanding of the operations of neoliberalism in a broader sense can help us identify and understand the power relations that animate bioethics and enable the proliferation of its governmental strategies. Section two, disaster colonialism disaster no, neoliberalism and disastrous ableism. In the shock doctrine, the rise of disaster capitalism, Klein sets out to show how neoliberal capitalism and capitalists variously produce and exploit disasters and crises in order to drastically change economies and governments. Klein's goal is to demonstrate that the detrimental impact on disenfranchised and other subordinated social groups of these economic and political swings is both foreseeable and disregarded, if not their desiderat desideratum. For Klein, the wizard of the social movement was Chicago school economist Milton Friedman. For example, as, as Klein explains, Friedman used Hurricane Katrina and the flooding of New Orleans in 2005 to, to facilitate privatization of the city's public education system. A far-reaching far policy change that was among the disastrous consequences of Hurricane Katrina that disproportionately affected the city's Black residents. As Friedman put it at the time, and I quote, most New Orleans schools are in ruins, as are the homes of the children who have attended them. The children are now scattered all over the country. This is a tragedy. It is also an opportunity to radically reform the educational system, end quote. Less than two years after the levies, after the levies were breached, privately run charter schools had almost entirely replaced the New Orleans public school system. The contract with the New Orleans Teachers Union had effectively been torn to pieces and the union's 4,700 members had been fired. For Klein, this dismantling of the New Orleans public school system post-Katrina exemplifies disaster capitalism, which she defines as orchestrated raids, and I quote, orchestrated raids on the public sphere in the wake of catastrophic events, combined with the treatment of disasters as exciting market opportunities, end quote. In an article that recently appeared in The Guardian, Klein and Capuala Sprout explain how disaster capitalism, which takes different forms in different geopolitical contexts, has conditioned responses to the wildfires that occurred in Maui last month. Indeed, as Klein and Sprout write, and I quote, some Native Hawaiians have taken to calling their unique version of disaster capitalism by a slightly different term, that is, dis plantation disaster capitalism. It's a name that speaks to contemporary forms of neocolonialism and climate profiteering, like the real estate agents cold calling Lahaina residents who have lost everything to the fire and prodding them to sell their ancestral lands rather than wait for compensation. But it also places these moves inside the long and ongoing history of settler colonial resource theft and trickery, making clear that while disaster capitalism might have some modern disguises, it's a very old tactic, end quote. For more than a century, Klein and Sprout point out, 
Water across the western region of the island has been extracted to benefit, benefit outside interests. First, large sugar plantations, and more recently, their corporate successors. Shortly after the wildfires broke out, these corporations and business interests, interests with collaboration from Hawaii's governor, Josh Green, began to seek ways both to nullify the legislative protections of Hawaii's most precious natural resource, that is its water, and to further divert the water available to native Hawaiians. Klein and Sprout maintain that settler colonial water consumption all over Maui, water consumption both limited and authorized through legislated water use, per, per, water use permits, that is water used for the swimming pools of lavish Hawaiian hotels, the glistening wet golf courses of Maui, and the luxury estates that large corporations all over Maui operate, limited the extent to which the wildfires of Lahaina could be extinguished. It is especially pertinent to my work on disability and eugenics that disaster capitalism exploits disasters and crises to mold social values, norms, expectations, and explanations in ways that promote neoliberal social and political agendas amongst academics, the media, NGOs, and populations at large, in addition to how it exploits these events to profoundly change governments and economic systems themselves. I contend that all levels of government in so-called Canada, as well as various academics, journalists, think tanks, corporations, and foundations have seized upon the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportune occasion to engage in what I call disaster ableism, that is, have exploited the pandemic and the circumstances that surround it to cultivate norms, values, and beliefs that promote ableist agendas and eugenic goals. In particular, the government of Canada and the bioethicists to whom Canadian politicians regularly defer and appeal have employed disaster ableism to usher into law legislation, namely Bill C-7, that significantly expands and more deeply embeds eugenics in Canadian society. In the midst of a global pandemic, when the residents of Canada were losing their loved ones, their dwellings and their incomes due to COVID-19, were living in situations of fear, misinformation and confusion, and were, were distracted and isolated, the Canadian government bypassed adequate public co consultation, usurped international treaties, ignored the objections of Indigenous leaders, manipulated parliamentary procedure, and made a mockery of disabled experts invited to participate in this in its legislative proceedings in order to ensure passage of Bill C-7, legislation that would make sweeping changes to existing Canadian laws on medically assisted suicide and euthanasia. In short, the same neoliberal government which throughout the pandemic has consistently refused to provide financial and other su social supports to disabled people, allowing thousands of them to die from COVID-19 and neglect in nursing homes and other carceral institutions in which disabled people are confined, has adopted a pernicious way to, in the words of Friedman, permanently reform distribution to disabled people, namely by providing them with easier access to premature death, <laughs> rather than provided by providing them with the means to live their lives. Canadian bioethicists, law professors, politicians, and some very privileged white disabled people maintain that Bill C-7 promises greater equality for disabled people by further enshrining their rights to autonomy and self-determination. However, poor racialized indigenous, trans and queer disabled people recognize that Bill C-7 constitutes, constitutes a threat to their collective existence, in addition to the threat that the legislation poses to their personal safety, sense of security, <laughs> sense of belonging and self-respect. While Canadian bio, bioethicist law professors and politicians have elicited chaos from the Canadian um, can you hear me? There's there's a strange noise. I'm um, sorry, I don't know if I, can you hear me? Yes. Can you okay, hear I'm going to, I, I'm going to continue. Well, Canadian bioethicists, law professors and politicians elicited, have elicited pathos from the Canadian public 
with poignant speeches about disabled people who required immediate deliverance from the suffering that their lives would impose if Bill C-7 were not passed. Disabled activists, academics, policy researchers, and their allies have pointed out that poverty, structural ableism, and racism, lack of affordable, accessible housing, and settler colonialism are among the factors that constitute unlivable lives for disabled people in so-called Canada. Insofar as philosophers disregard the expertise of these disabled critics have made, including the expertise of disabled philosophers of disability, they engage in a duplicitous form of epistemic oppression that runs counter to established and emerging feminist and other social epistemologies. Through medicalization and individualization, bioethics promotes euthanasia and medically assisted suicide by mystifying the socio-discursive and biopolitical origins of the contingent circumstances that surround the enactment of this dreadful intervention, reconfiguring these circumstances to seem as if they require the specialized knowledge that bioethicists are claimed to possess. Although Canadian bioethicist law professors and politicians assert that Bill C-7 was a unique corrective to past legislative mistakes and that arguments to the contrary amount to fallacious slippery slope reasoning. Canadian pe disabled people in Canada adamantly argue that Bill C-7 is of a piece with a long and treacherous history of eugenic policies and practices in Canada, such as forced sterilization targeted at disabled people and indigenous people among others that the incremental normalization of the policies and practices depoliticizes and erases. Insofar as proponents of medically assisted suicide conceive of power, freedom, and autonomy in terms of negative liberty, they obscure the successful normalization of neoliberal relations of power by and through the in effective incul inculcation and utilization of a relatively recent kind of subjectivity, namely the self-determining and self governing individual who is enabled to act in accordance with a narrowly circumscribed set of possible actions. Modern relations of power have already conspired to put in place the options from which one may autonomously choose, as my argument in reproductive freedom, self-regulation, and the government of impairment in utero was designed to show. In other words, the charge according to which critics have made invoke fallacious slippery slope reasoning relies on outdated modes, uh, outmoded ideas about the self-originating character of the neoliberal subjects, freedom and autonomy that are integral to this juridical conception of power. In short, the autonomous informed and consenting individual in whose name biopolitical arguments that promote both made and reproductive technologies are advanced is a historically and culturally specific artifact of discourse rather than a prediscursive being slash self endowed with intrinsic liberties and freedoms. Indeed, the self-determining citizen slash patient that neoliberal bioethics upholds and claims to dignify through Bill C-7 in particular and medically assisted suicide more generally has a history and a relatively recent and culturally specific history at that. Section three, against unprecedented presence. The argument that arguments that bioethicist law professors and politicians advance about Bill C-7 in particular and the expansion of medically assisted suicide in general are typical of the colonial presentism that as White notes is a characteristic feature of epistemologies of crisis. Recall that White uses the term epistemologies of crisis to refer to colonialist narratives and ways of knowing that characterize certain situations and states of affairs as unprecedented and, and urgent, ignoring histories of colonization and traditional teachings of indigenous communities to do so. Sometimes, White notes, per perpetrators of colonialism imagine that their wrongful practices and actions are defensible because the practices and actions are responses to a given crisis, whether perceived or actual. That is, the perpetrators assume that a suspension of certain concerns about justice and morality is justified in response to a crisis. In the first half of the 20th century, for example, Americans constructed dams that flooded the, the Seneca and Lakota peoples because, as White says, they believed that the United States needed energy and irrigation to lessen the threat of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. 
Thus, although settlers tend to characterize the current situation with respect to climate change as unprecedented, White states that, and I quote, indigenous peoples of Turtle Island have already passed through human-caused ecological catastrophe at least once in their history, end quote. For Indigenous people, Mark White remarks, and I quote, the current climate change ordeal is bad but not unprecedented, end quote. In this regard, White points to the work of Candace Callison, who, in reference to Indigenous people, Indigenous peoples in the Arctic, suggests that settler analyses of climate change that characterize the current situation as unprecedented fail to recognize, and I quote, what climate change pretends for those who have endured a century of immense cultural, political, and environmental changes, end quote. Indeed, White remarks that settler colonialism must be understood as inextricably entwined with climate change and responded to as such. White is concerned to point out, furthermore, that the belief according to which acts of colonial oppression are allegedly defensible due to crises is not a relic of the distant past, but rather occurs now too. As White put it, puts it, and I quote, from scientific reports that provincialize Indigenous knowledge systems to wind power projects that desecrate Indigenous lands, there's no reason to believe that colonialism today is something other than an evolved practice of a familiar form of power, end quote. Epistemologies of crisis white states involve, and I quote, knowing the world such that a certain present is experienced as new, end quote. In other words, crisis epistemologies are presentist in their narrative orientation. A narrative is presentist, White explains, if it assumes a certain conception of the unfolding of time as means to achieve power or protect privilege. Presentist orientations favor experiences of time that presume unprecedentedness and urgency. That is, presentism is an exercise of colonial power that effaces the historical realities and conditions of this colonial power. White refers, for example, to Audra Simpson, who writes that the purported newness of the settler colonial present is, and I quote, revealed as the fiction of the presumed neutrality of time itself demonstrating the dominance of the present by some over others and the unequal power to define what matters, who matters, what pasts are alive and when they die, end quote. In this way, White notes, one becomes so preoccupied with the present crisis as new that one questions neither one's own perspective nor the social origins from which the perspective may derive. The sense of imminence that accompanies presentism, White says, leads people to obscure or minimize how their actions relate to the persistence of colonialism, capitalism, ableism, racism, and other forms of power. My argument is that the events, justifications, and rationale surrounding the creation and passage of Bill C-7 have been framed within a presentist eugenic narrative of utilitarianism that erases the histories of genocide in Canada. By framing Bill C-7 as a unique and urgent new procedural corrective, Canadian bioethicist law professors, journalists, and politicians have again reconfigured and obfuscated the incremental normalization of eugenic practices in precisely the way that White describes. That is, according to the presentist orientation of an epistemology of crisis that disregards the genesis and evolution of these practices. In other words, the incremental normalization of eugenic bioethical practices and the apparatus of disability from which this strategic presentist mechanism derives have their origin in colonialism and the white liberal settler state. In the context of Maine, the presentist orientation, which is characteristic of utilitarian bioethics, bioethicists and the subfield of bioethics in general, implicitly constructs the notions of personal autonomy and quality of life exists as existing outside of any temporal location, as ahistorical, as timeless, and as universal. In so doing, this presentist orientation conceals the historically contingent and culturally specific character of these politically motivated ideals, as well as the way that these artifacts emerge from and reproduce the neoliberal settler state itself itself. Thank you for your attention. I'm, I'm sorry, but there, um, a, a very strange noise came on the screen at one point, and I, I didn't know if I was still connected or not. <laughs> 
Can you hear me, Professor? Professor? Tremaine? Yes, I can. Yes, we heard your, your paper. Um, thank thank you. you so much for your presentation. So now we have ample time for uh, questions and comments and reflections and just overall discussion. Um, let me just uh, jump in before we get started that um, just a very quick announcement that uh, towards the end, when we end this panel, Kamisha Russell will be giving closing remarks virtually. I think Kamisha is all, already connected and with us. Um, so, uh, so we'll do, so Kamisha will be delivering those remarks and then the happy hour will, um, will happen just outside of this hall. Okay, so, so questions, comments, please raise your hand. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, this one. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, uh, all for your this wonderful presentations. I have one question from Professor uh, Littlejohn and one from Professor Murillo. Uh, Professor Littlejohn, uh, I was wondering because of your framework um, in terms of access and rights, uh, yesterday Professor Yudarquis Espinosa Muñozo was, uh, gave a powerful um, argument that centering the access of abortion in a kind of liberal framework um, has also occluded a history of epistemic violence towards, towards um, originary indigenous communities and their practices of abortion. So I was wondering how your um, framework of stratified reproductive justice could um, engage with that uh, problematic. Uh, and to Professor Murillo, um, thank you so much. Uh, considering Professor uh, Joy James' remarks in the morning, um, you rightfully, uh, I believe, uh, frame the issue of the border in terms of war. However, as you unfolded um, your account, um, I was wondering if you think this might, the way it, it, it was unfolded, kind of occludes a very particular aspect of the war, which is cisgenderism. Because you uh, kind of unfolded um, our account of focusing on contraception and abortion, and you mentioned men and women in kind of broad terms, but trans feminicide and trans and transvestite, transvestite resistance has also been crucial in the border, particularly the US-Mexico border as a site. And so I'm wondering how your reproductive justice account can understand that particular aspect of the war, which is this gender element of it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that for that question. I really appreciate it. So I one thing that I think is uh, really important to make clear is that when it comes to reproductive justice, reproductive justice isn't just about centering people's rights. And I think that's what I really appreciate the ability to kind of expand on things I couldn't talk about in the in the presentation. And so one of the key things with reproductive justice was that it came about because it, the folks that started the movement felt like it was really important to make sure we're centering the needs of marginalized populations that weren't being included in the mainstream discourse. And as part of that discourse, there was this emphasis almost squarely on uh, access to abortion. And as, as you mentioned, um, and as I can only briefly talk about in my talk today, uh, the, when we think about the needs of indigenous folks and think about the needs of black folks, brown folks, um, one of the key issues is that not only did they have issues with being able to get abortion when they needed it, they had issues with being able to parent their children. They had issues with being able to raise their children. They had issues with being able to have their children uh, because of uh, white, super white supremacist and colonial violence. And so one of the key things with RJ is a focus on rights, health, and justice, um, and a focus on making sure that we center what communities say that they want, what communities say that they need, and with community histories to be able to recognize um, that what folks need is dictated by those communities. And we need to make sure that we're listening for what those communities need rather than um, trying to impose a broader vision um, of 
whatever the the person who's doing the theorizing believes that folks need. And so I think from my perspective, um, I see stratified reproductive justice as a framework that can help start with thinking about the needs of communities and then go out from there, keeping um, in, in mind uh, the, the histories of, of violence and subjugation that they have faced, as well as the histories of resistance that they have brought to the fore uh, to make sure they, they advocate to get their needs met and to get those needs recognized, not only focusing on rights um, because of various issues that we were, I'm sure we're familiar with, uh, with the right, the ability of courts uh, to actually recognize and their willingness to recognize uh, the human rights of, of various groups. And so I, I, for me, I think the key with stratified RJ is using it as a framework that allows us to expand beyond the um, original groups that that folks were thinking of theorizing when it come or thinking of um, trying to articulate uh, needs for uh, with when the original of I mean of of reproductive justice to make sure that as we expand beyond those communities we're not at risk of having the framework co-opted by by lack of criticality I think your your question gets at that the need for the criticality um, that you're bringing to the front so I'll go ahead and stop there not try and go on too long. Thank you, and um, I appreciate your question because I think you're, you know, so most of my, I'm a historian, so most of my work is focused um, predominantly in the 20th century, the early 20th century, and I think some of the earlier quotations that I was hint that I was um, discussing were from the 1970s, but certainly I think more recently, um, the clear focus on especially trans women in detention centers, right? The fact that um, there have been many deaths um, and how that connects to family formation and kinship formation and how we begin to think about um, that third prong of reproductive justice. How do we maintain and raise families in safe and sustainable environments? I think gets at um, decentering cisgenderism within reproductive justice um, and within that sphere. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking about the past and how, how we bring the past to talk about reproductive justice um, as, as, a, as an idea that was, that kind of came to the fore through sort of, um, through the work of black feminists in the US, but certainly through their inspiration from um, global movements for human rights uh, historians are coming to this kind of late in the game. We're still trying to understand how reproductive, how we, how we can understand reproductive justice in the past. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I continue to sort of think through um, how we, um, how we think about reproductive justice, um, and looking at historically marginalized people. Um, and my my research at this particular moment does center. Um, cisgender Mexican origin women um, and other women of color um, as those who have at that particular moment um, survived um, brutal attempts to curtail their access to have children, right? Who have been historically denied. Um, but I certainly am thinking critically about, about the issue that you're raising um, currently and how that manifests currently right, um, the centering of cisgenderism within reproductive justice. So thank you. Wonderful. Questions, comments, reflections? Uh, thank you all so much for your talks. Uh, Professor Tremaine, my question is for you, actually. I'm wondering if you can speak more to the relationship, as you uh, mentioned in your talk, on kind of climate disaster and reproductive justice, especially when we've seen with, you know, the various wildfires that are happening in Canada. Uh, I'm more familiar with the ones happening in, in the Western part, but the way in which the, this has disrupted Indigenous practices, especially in terms of Indigenous birth work and the kind of interrelationship between disability and birth work in regards to this. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the question because some of it was didn't come through clear to me, clearly to me. So if you wouldn't mind repeating the question, 
Yeah, for sure. I apologize. Um, so my question concerns kind of the relationship between climate disaster and, and reproductive justice, especially in terms of um, the politics of Canada. Um, I'm thinking about a lot of the disruption that has happened through the wildfires in, in Yellowknife and kind of the birth work being done, especially by disabled and Indigenous activists in trying to help um, people giving birth kind of regain access to these resources and these practices and um, the kind of tension between the various policies at the state level and kind of activist level work. So if you could just say more, because you, you talk a bit about the kind of climate disaster in your talks, so I was wondering if you could speak more to that, and if not, I completely understand as well. Thank you. Okay, um, I will try. Um, well, I uh, if uh, you you seem to be familiar with the situation in Canada, and um, uh, uh, the the if if you are, and it seems you are, then you know that um, uh, the um, the situation of Indigenous peoples in uh, northern regions, especially, uh, is. Uh, appalling with respect to healthcare services um, and educational services and, and any kind of public social services. Um, so the um, so of course in in situations where like for instance like the recent um, wildfires, um, those communities um, uh, do not get the resources they need and um, so and and you know there's a way that the gov that the government of Canada always manages to um, uh, cover over what the situation is you know the situation that's actually unfolding for these communities. So um, the the reproductive um, you know um, people. Uh, reproductive justice for um, people in these situations is is dire i mean even even you know at, at times you know at times which we wouldn't identify as crises i mean there's a, there's an ongoing crisis in in indigenous communities in in northern canada especially with respect to um water supply i mean the, there's you know, um, indigenous most indigenous communities have been under um, bottled water um, uh, cautioning um, for you know for even decades, and so um, so we don't need a crisis such as a wide a wildfire for um, to expect that um, the reproductive uh, the access to reproductive. Uh, uh, services and reproductive justice is going to be um curtailed i mean it's always it's it's always um compromised it doesn't need a crisis um but um in situations of crisis um uh it's easy to uh, it, it's easier for the government to um uh erase the ongoing um struggles in this regard and and sort of you know put them into a a, a time uh put them into a, a, a time limited um capacity um so i hope that answers your your question to some extent okay i'm gonna put myself in the queue if that's okay. Okay, uh, I know we're all a little tired here, but I'm gonna keep this moving. So I kind of, I've been, I want to try to draw some of the threads that have emerged over the past three days of our conversation. And I just wanna thank our panelists for coming again um, to, to close us out with such a really interesting and beautiful conversation. I, because of the panel this morning, um, we were talking a lot about sort of like capture, uh, the capture by state apparatuses of life otherwise, the slipperiness and the totalizing attempts of that capture, and yet life persists and isn't fully captured. 
I think about the category of life a lot when I think about reproduction broadly, but in particular in reproductive justice. And it's the theme that I see among all your papers. I'm wondering how, whether it's, you know, theoretically, sociologically, or historically, how we see different struggles around reproduction um, in terms of access to reproductive health, but also the third tenet of RJ, right? Like making, uh, defining safety over and against the way the carceral nation state will define safety for us, right? Defining like love and safe environments in a way that attempts to escape uh, capture, if at all possible, by uh, the American or Canadian and Western nation state. So I was just wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about the category of life um, in your work and in the struggles for this um, this sort of re liberation in which human life is, which we all seek in which human life is able to flourish in many, many, many modalities instead of some modalities being uplifted as the normative, coercive, and punitive ideal against other forms of life. I hope that was not too abstract. Okay, great. I know. I mean, I'm not a philosopher, so I'm just out here doing things. Um, and I, I appreciate your question, Ri. Uh, and and in fact, I, I want to thank you because you've helped me think through some of the stuff. Um, we met at a NEH care forum last summer, um, and it was just, there was like two historians and a bunch of philosophers. It was very intimidating. Um, but it was really wonderful because I've been thinking through a category um, that I'm, I'm, I'm working through it. Again, historians, fear theory. Um, if it's not in a, it's not in a, you know, source, then it's like, ah, um, but I, I want to think through this notion of reproductive care, um, which for me, I'm defining it as the, the sort of like interstitial space, um, that is in many ways slippery and, um, and lives outside of the sort of tension that historians love to use the, like, you're either resisting oppression or you're like under oppression and there's like no middle ground. You're in one of those constantly. Um, and so, and with, <laughs> we've talked at nauseam at, about social reproduction, which I find so generative for how I'm thinking about reproductive care, because I think that there's something that's being produced at the same time um, through the labor, especially of, of the, the women that I'm, I'm writing about. Um, that is oriented and not that is oriented not towards capital and not towards the state, but is oriented towards the collective and the community. And I'm still thinking about this um, and how that is about the category of life and reproducing life through care. Um, and some of the, the communities that I'm looking at, um, you know, in places like El Paso, Texas, where um, up until the 1980s, so from, from the early 20th century until the 80s, something like 85 or 90 percent of poor Mexican origin women were domestic workers in the homes of white settlers in that place. Um, and so I, I, I you know, that is nearly a century of doing the same work of rearing children that are not your own, of making food for family that is not your own, um, as a as a as a way to invest in the future of your own children, um, as a way to create spaces for your own children so that eventually, right, if we look at the 1960s and 70s, when you have the rise of the Chicano movement in El Paso, you have you have resistance in this very visible public way, um, what fuels that? Um, what fuels that uh, that is, again, not something that's oriented towards the neoliberal state, but that is something that is um, historically bound to community care and collective care. 
And so I'm thinking through these, um, through these kinds of moments where the state cannot totally capture humanity and, and how do we understand, how do we understand that? So I'm, I'm still grappling with it. Thanks for listening to my ramblings, but I appreciate that question. Thank you. Do you mind if I jump in next, shall we? Okay. Um. So I think, and I'll I'll echo this, and and so I'm I'm not um sure that I'm familiar uh, with how we're thinking about capture here, and I I see this an opportunity for me to learn. So if I use it in a way that doesn't make sense, also please feel free uh, to let me know because I I can I can learn a lot and continue to learn a lot from our conversation. And so for me, I think of life in my research in terms of people's lived experiences. And so I rely, I'm a mixed methodologist, but I do, uh, so I do quantitative work and qualitative work. Um, and a key part of my thinking, particularly when I'm looking through my interview data and interviewing folks is trying to grapple with how our mental models and theoretical models uh, actually line up with people's lived experiences. And in my work in pregnancy prevention, and examining people's experiences with birth control, a really key thing is that our models are really bad. Our mental models are just really bad um, at explaining what is actually happening for people, happening for people in their real lives. Uh, and so what I've tried to do with my work is think about how we can better learn about people's lived experiences to create better models and to shift our paradigms. And so can I, um, well, when I had the first question, I'm sorry that I, I'm not going to be, I can't remember uh, your name. I don't want to uh, get it wrong, but um, I uh, really appreciated this question about access because in my work, when, we, when I think about capture and state capture, I think about the ways that we can miss what is actually needed in people's daily lives when we focus on things like contraceptive access, right? So there's this idea that because there are all of these prescription methods and they're very highly effective, that people have what they need. They have, even though we know there are issues with access, the existence of those methods means that these methods have to be liberatory. And a key part of my work in thinking about life and people's lived experiences is interrogating that, right? And showing that if we move beyond just thinking about what is happening, um, in courts, what is happening uh, at the state level, when we start looking at what's happening in people's relationships, uh, we can start to see how access is only one part of the story and how um, we can't have a liberatory birth control politics if people don't feel like they're actually able to use methods in a way that is liberating for them. And so, uh, so the work that I've done in the past and that I um, am continuing to do into the future is to grapple with how can we create a more liberatory birth control politics that's grounded in reproductive justice, uh, but that's also squarely grounded in people's lived experiences, not necessarily just our ways of thinking about their lived experience, but to try the as best as we can uh, to have our mental models of life better reflect those lives, recognizing there, there's, we're not gonna get it perfect, but just trying to continue to get closer and closer to that. Thank you. Dr. Tremaine, I think, Tremaine, I think if you would like, like to, to share, share your thoughts, thoughts you're, you're welcome, welcome to. Uh, well, um, since I um, a lot of my work uh, uses Foucault or um, is in, in some way influenced by Foucault, and of course, um, uh, biopower is central to um, Foucault's understanding of power, at least in, in uh, one phase of his um, work. Um, and biopower is um, a kind of power that uh, uh, wants, you know, that is is motivated to facilitate um, uh, the uh, enhancement of life. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, so and so much of my work has focused or has revolved around um, looking at um uh, looking at reproductive technologies and disability. I mean, my I, my work in philosophy of disability um, has been influenced by Foucault's work in biopower, and so I've been I, I've I've um, looked at um, uh, you know uh, 
uh, reproductive technologies and disability, um, stem cell research and disability, uh, and most recently, um, as as I've indicated in a presentation I gave, um, uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide and disability, and how um, and how the uh, forces to um, uh, enhance and enlarge and expand and increase life of, of human beings, certain human, certain populations of human beings, um, how this it really, I mean, uh, if you, if you talk to ethicists, they, they'll talk about, um, you know, um, notions of, uh, you know, like quality of life. And what I'm, what I'm doing in my work is, um, looking, looking at how, uh, notions such as uh, quality of life, autonomy, et cetera, are really tactics um, that uh, are, are used to um, uh, govern, uh, control, uh, and manipulate um, certain groups of people and even extinguish certain groups of people, such as, I mean, the, the group that I um, uh, 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 um, centrally concerned, which is with, with which is um, you know disabled people and um, and uh, how they and of course disabled people. It's it's not a monolithic group, uh, you know, of, of society. It's um, uh, varied uh, across uh, race, gender, age, um, sexuality, um, etc. So um, that I guess that's what I would say question hi thank you um what was coming to my mind was just a kind of thread uh weaving through some of the things that were talked about today um and it and so i just thought um that I'd like to talk about it, ask you about it. Um, I guess I was thinking about Chrissy Lee's talk when she was talking about um, mothering as uh, an orientation um, toward a world where, a different world where black life is capable of being, of <laughs> flourishing um, and how that action is future oriented and it's kind of a, um, a rejection in some sense of the world that is, um, while it's also very realistic about the world that is, otherwise it wouldn't be responsible um, to do care for the vulnerable people uh, that are the objects of that care. Um, and I guess I was, and then, and then, sorry, to talk about Chris's talk, um, but this I think sets the stage for the this issue of history, you know, being a historian and also, um, um, Dr. Tremaine's uh, critique of the presentism. Um, so, Sadia Hartman, you know, she brings to life the kind of way in which women, mostly women in the past, I mean, I'm thinking about a particular text, um, were animated by that future vision. And when we look back at them, all we see is the facticity, right? So, right. so, so Hartman, Hartman is trying to bring back to life that. The, what was animating the action of those women and how they were engaged in practices of freedom. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the text. And I'm sure some of you know it. Anyway, um, I think I, I just wonder about the practice of history, you know, whether, whether in history or whether as historians, you know, that's what you're looking for, not, not just at the facts of the matter, but how is this moment, how is this moment um, enlivened how was it an enactment, enactment of a vision of, of a vision for a particular kind of freedom? And how, how can, can we do justice to it as that, um, which I think is the work of Sidia Hartman is trying to do. Um, but then in relation to the, you know, the Canadian government or the um, crisis, uh, uh, sorry, disaster ableism, um, crisis colonialism, and so on, the way in which uh, what is, it, it's, there's a kind of oppression that takes the form of a uh, 
um, suppression of time into the moment, right? So, so you can't, we can't talk about the past. We don't want to bring in the past. What we need to do deal with right now is the crisis of the present so that the, the colonial government, for instance, erases its own responsibility for having brought about the present moment. And also in the context of um, uh, Bill C-7, um, conceals its responsibility for the, the non-flourishing of life that would milk make um, assisted suicide uh, the, the option for someone. Um, so I, I guess I'm just interested in this, this thread whereby um, what's wrong, the wrong, the harm that's being done is this reduction of um, the past to a facticity where we, we no longer see what is animating it. We're no longer um, allowed to, to I, I guess the dominance is something that's exercised as a, in the mode of suppression of the aliveness of the past. And uh, yes, sorry, the length of that comment, but I was trying to thread together a bunch of different things. Any responses? Any other question, comment, reflection? Holly asked if uh, he put himself in the queue. I'm sorry, I didn't see Tom. No, 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 that's okay. Do we, Do we have, have time, time for, for yes. one more? Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, so you so much for this incredible panel. Um, I'm gonna ask this question quickly um, and then give just a slight bit of context. I'm wondering how much between this conversation we should be thinking about reproductive justice as aiming at more of a total societal transformation to enable reproductive capacities of all of us to some degree. And obviously like that's biologically different among each individual case of a uh, human, but how much like to make good on these demands requires a whole social transformation. And I ask this, my work focuses on Palestinian liberation and most of the Palestinian feminists uh, are really contending that like Palestinian liberation, the abolition of Israel to core uh, uh, is, is a feminist, a feminist issue, issue because it's, it's from occupation, occupation and the Israeli settler colonial state that much of the current uh, sexual violence, gendered violence, and limitations on reproductive freedoms Palestinian women and others face comes from, or at least is exacerbated by. So I'm wondering if that like kind of theoretical, but also strategic way of framing the problem like resonates with any of y'all's work. Uh, and just kind of invite you to think through that, like how much of our societies that we're thinking through need to be like completely revolutionized to make good on these demands. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and use Dr. Littlejohn's own work to think about that. I mean, I think that the um, the notion of stratified reproductive justice is in many ways like a reckoning with history. Um, we we cannot do the, this thing that we're talking about without reckoning with the way that our society has stratified and devalued the lives of certain people, right? And that's certainly the case of Palestine. Um, and so, one, we have to be allowed to teach history as it exists, right? So the notion that we can't even teach history um, and the, the fact that there are states passing laws to make it difficult to even teach history through this very critical lens, right, is already a turn in a really shitty direction um, because it, it, it just reifies the notion that white supremacy and settler colonialism colonialism is natural. Um, it's a natural state of existence. And so I think 
the redefining of reproductive justice and putting stratified to say like this, this is this is a historically contingent analysis that we have to do to know how to address these historically contingent harms. Um, that's that's the reorientation I think that you're you're getting at, right? This like total transformation, um, which I think is critical. Yeah. Absolutely, and in addition to to um, what you, what you were, my colleague here was just saying, um, what I would also add is that the way that I the, I think the answer to your question in my mind is present in reproductive justice, and I think I, I really I love how you were just using SRJ to kind of ex to kind of push us forward. SRJ kind of helps us expand. But reproductive justice is based in eradicating oppression, and oppression is fundamentally structural. And so in order to eradicate oppression and achieve reproductively just futures, we have to eradicate oppressions that are based in structures, and that requires transformation. That, 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 what that transformation is going to look like, how we're going to accomplish that transformation, obviously those things are, are unclear. Uh, but to me, it is eminently clear that the solution to the oppressions that are facing Palestinian folks, as, as you're mentioning, that are facing a whole host of populations that we care about, the solution is really focusing on dealing with the roots of oppression, and those roots are structural, and that requires transformative practices. Um, okay, um, if I may add um, to um, those um, very um, compelling comments, um, I have a paper um, which is forthcoming in the feminist in feminist uh, philosophy quarterly. And the last sentence of the um, paragraph is, let the revolution begin. Um, because, um, as I argued in my book, Foucault and Feminist Philosophy of Disability, and as I argue again in this paper, um, I think there needs to be a conceptual revolution with respect to um, how um, disability is understood. And again, if you, if you didn't catch it in my talk, I think that disability uh, needs to be understood as an apparatus of power rather than a property of individuals. Um, uh, and so it needs to be understood as an apparatus in which everyone is uh, entangled and entwined rather than something that some people have and some people don't. Um, uh, so I think that, um, and I think that um, calling for that kind of revolution is um, a, significant challenge for philosophy. Um, and I, I mean, you know, in this paper and uh, in the more expanded version of it that will appear in the collection that I've edited, uh, um, the Bloomsbury Guide to Philosophy of Disability, um, the uh, philosophy uh, needs to, needs to seriously, um, uh, deal with the fact that it, it, one element of uh, a, a, a very a growing element of the discipline, namely bioethics, is at its root um, grounded, you know, it's eugenics. Um, uh, and um, so to me, um, that's why I say that uh, bioethics needs to be abolished in order to, excuse me, in order to revol re revolutionize philosophy and revolutionize how um, disabled people are treated in society and in philosophy, in the university, um, et cetera, we need to uh, uh, abolish bioethics. So much, thank you for that. Um, so I think we can uh, come to a close. Thanks so much our speakers and for everyone who asked a question and shared their reflections.
So we will turn our attention now to Kamisha Russell, who will be delivering some closing remarks. Okay, um, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I can't see myself, so that's disconcerting, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so I, here I am, I'm, I'm back, I'm doing fine. Uh, thank you to so many of you for asking after my health. Um, I'm so sorry I couldn't be present with you uh, these last couple of days. Uh, apparently, I only get COVID when I've helped organize and been integral to an event. So the first and only other time I got COVID was when I was a co-organizer of our 2022 departmental commencement ceremony, and I tested positive the morning of. So um, <laughs> that's that's my thing, I guess. Um, but I have been around on email, by text, and on phone, uh, doing what I can to keep things running. But of course, this would not have been possible at all without all the people who stepped up uh, in my absence. So I really want to—I want to thank my co-organizers who did so much more logistical work and on-the-ground problem solving than I had intended for them. Um, and I really want to give the most special thanks to all of our volunteers. Um, and if you could all stand up as I call your name, I have no idea if you're doing it or not, but I'm going to call them and hope you stand up. Uh, Brooke Burns, Annie Ring, Tolly Bitten, Carolyn Lundquist, Gonzalo Bustamante Moya, Nick Denning, Maya Wellborn, Zainab Nabwadi, Rhiannon Lindgren, Julie Williams Reyes, Amanda De Brule, and any of the other graduate and undergraduate students who might still be around who volunteered their time at the registration desk. Um, yeah, I hope you can stand up also. And I, I hope everyone can just give them a big hand. We have. Okay, good. <laughs> I have no idea. I can't hear anything. Um, so. <laughs> Glad, good to know. Um, okay, so uh, there are lots of other people I also uh, want to thank. The, these remarks are primarily thanks. Um, UO Conference Services was so generous in allowing me to make changes to people's lodging choices right up to and even during the conference. So I, I really appreciate uh, them for that. Um, catering answered the call when we ran out of creamer and they upped our coffee order because apparently we're all very caffeine dependent. Uh, and they had some really tasty food for us at the archive reception. And the bartenders kept the bar open right until the end, even though they're supposed to start closing it at 730. Um, so, you know, just great appreciation for them. And, you know, I have no idea, but hopefully they're out there setting up your stuff right now for a great closing happy hour. Um, speaking of the archive reception, I want to thank Linda Long, the UO Special Collections Archivist. Not only did she beforehand advocate for library sponsorship for our event, and really um, it was a big part of that, but she curated and gave you a tour of the UO Feminist Archival Collections while we waited for the bar to be ready. So there were no drinks available to you at the time that Linda was showing you those collections. So I really appreciate her uh, taking the time to do that. And also um, she stayed at the library to allow our reception to happen, even though the library had forgotten to schedule staff for the reception. So she just stayed um, of her own accord so that we could have the reception as scheduled. And I, I just really appreciate her a lot. I know she's not in the room, but um, you know, we'll, we'll try to send her something um, when we have time. Uh, and speaking of curating, I also wanna thank the UO Museum of Natural History. Um, where we had our first reception on Wednesday night. Remember, if you're around tomorrow morning, if you're not leaving town um, until later in the day tomorrow, you can still see the Outliers and Outlaws uh, stories from the Eugene Lesbian History Project exhibit and the World's Oldest Shoes. Uh, they open at 10 a.m. and you get in free if you mention the conference. So if you are looking for something to do tomorrow morning, that is a thing you could do. I wanna thank all of our attendees and presenters for coming and sharing your work and helping us to create this imperfect, but always generative moment of feminist community. And I especially wanna thank those who promote, presented remotely, who probably also aren't hearing me right now, but they did hang in there while our very intrepid volunteers sorted out innumerable technical difficulties. So a lot of appreciation for the volunteers and the people who presented uh, remotely.
Um, speaking of remote participation, um, I want to thank our IS Media Services uh, live streaming team. Uh, because I was here at home trying to follow the conference, I got a chance to see just how well the live stream went. Um, they managed to incorporate our presenter slides no matter how last minute they were received. And in some cases, it was a very short turnaround. So they just did a fabulous job, and I, I really appreciate it. And of course, the background, the backbone of our shared experience of the conference are 19 plenary panelists and their moderators. We were so fortunate to benefit not only from their exceptional talks, but from the magic that emerges when such powerful thinkers are brought together with each other and with a generous and engaged audience. I was consistently and genuinely moved by your collective contributions. Can we give them all another round of applause? All right, I'm assuming we've done so. <laughs> And uh, speaking of collective contributions, uh, I'd like to ask our Spanish to English interpreters to stand up now, and I'd like us to give them a hand for their great work. So assuming that occurred, these graduate student interpreters who are not professionals, but they're not volunteers because they were paid, did such a great job and made possible an important and hopefully ongoing encounter between multiple feminist lineages and methodologies. Um, having only watched the live stream, I'm not sure to what extent that this was emphasized, but those of you who do not read Spanish can further engage with the thought of these decolonial feminist panelists and their colleagues who were not here um, for the conference in Hypatia's summer 2022 special issue, Decolonial Feminism in Latin America, an Essential Anthology. So that was volume 37, uh, issue three. So uh, yeah, please pick that up um, to spend more time engaging with their ideas and extending um, this dialogue that we have uh, tried to facilitate here at the conference. So um, now I will stop keeping you from your upcoming food and drink, which again, I hope is out there. So I hope you will find it in the courtyard just across from this room uh, when you go out and you know, safe travels, everyone. Try not to get COVID. I'm really sorry that I, I couldn't be there in person to, to hang out with all of you uh, to the end, but I really appreciate everything everyone did to uh, keep things going and make for a great experience. And thank you. And thanks, thank you, Kamisha. I, I don't know. If, can you hear me, Kamisha? I can, yes. Thank you for all the work all that the you work have that done. done. And for innumerable questions, you know, fielding our questions, meeting our needs, and just, just being uh, the fabulous person that you are. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Please enjoy and uh, let's continue the dialogue.